All right, well, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Brian Rosenblum. I am co-director of the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities, which is affectionately known as IDRH. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to our fifth annual forum. Um, we've already had two great days of, of workshops, and um, it's been great to, to see conversations and connections already starting to take place in person and over Twitter. And the, the program is really just beginning, so we have another great uh, talk today and a whole day of, of discussion and conversations uh, tomorrow. Um, so first, I just want to thank all of our workshop presenters over the last two days who gave phenomenal workshops. So I'd like to give them a hand. <laughs> and also to our uh, poster presenters here, uh, just this uh, display the posters in the back. And I'm just going to make a couple of quick thank yous and acknowledgments uh, before the program begins. Um, so the first thing is, um, oh, well, first I'd like to recognize also uh, my co-director for IDRH, uh, Phil Stinson, who is in the back. And also the co-director, I don't know if Ariane Dwyer is here, she's been the co-director for the last five years of IDRH. She's on leave uh, this year. So Phil is the interim um, while she's on leave. Uh, IDRH is a collaborative effort supported by the Hall Center for the Humanities, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and K Libraries. This has been a fantastic partnership and a great way to foster connections and collaborations across those three units. So I want to extend thanks to, um, to those, those three units, especially to, to Victor Bailey of the Hall Center, uh, Paul Kelton, the Associate Dean of the College, and to Kent Miller and Mary Roach, who are the interim deans uh, of the libraries. And I also want to uh, thank and acknowledge Kaya Research, uh, <coughs> along with Mary Emma Graham and the History of Black Writing Project. They've uh, provided some support for attendees to, to come to this conference, which is uh, much appreciated. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to uh, recognize the planning committee for this conference, uh, who organized everything from the program, to the logistics, to communication with the speakers, to the catering, just to make sure everything uh, is going smoothly. They've been working really hard for at least five or six months on this, and it's been um, a great, uh, great experience working with everybody. So I'm gonna point them out too. That's uh, Elika Ortega here in front. Stephanie Gamble, uh, our student assistants, uh, Aiden Mendez and Megan Ketchum were fabulous, and many other volunteers, uh, Marianne Reed helping with the, the Wi-Fi and wireless setup, and Tammy Alvin uh, helping all, all around, so, and, and many others as well, so that's been, that's been fantastic. Um, Let's see, and then a couple of logistical notes. Uh, so tomorrow's session will be at the Hall Center for the Humanities, which is just a two minute walk down the, down the, uh, down the hill from here. Um, there's a map online or we can point out directions. That will start at nine, um, and then I think at 8.30 there's, there's refreshments. There'll be a catered lunch uh, there as well. And let's see. Uh, we do have, um, we have made some reservations uh, for dinner uh, for a group of 15, uh, which is not going uh, <laughs> to get everybody, but at, at Merchant's uh, Restaurant downtown. Um, so if you want to self-organize, um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back that people can, can uh, sign up there and organize it. But there's also many other restaurants, and we just encourage everyone to, to form into groups and and um, go somewhere <laughs> fun to eat. Um, final Friday. It's final Friday at uh, downtown, which is um, art galleries and uh, are open the doors and some art walks, so all over downtown as well. So that'd be a great place to go right after right after this as well. Anything else? Uh, Okay, um, 
So to, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, I'm going to have uh, Elika Ortega come up. Thank you. led us to adopt and implement a survivor-centered post-custodial archival framework, 
which places survivors at the center of archival theory and practice and decenters the role of the professional archivist. I hope that such a discussion will demystify actual archival practice, as well as illustrate ways in which archi archivists have heeded Vin's call to dismantle wealth and power's control over knowledge production and work towards the decolonization of archival practice that diversifies the historical record, as well as supports the community struggles for empowerment. So before jumping into what exactly the Survivor Center post historical archival framework is, I wanted to step back a little and provide some context into where this emergent framework fits into the broader history of archival theory and practice. Modern Western archival formation has been heavily influenced by an early archival theorist, Sir Hilary Jenkinson, who proclaimed that archivists must uphold the authenticity of the record by maintaining it in exactly the same state in which its original creators left it. Many archivists have since subscribed to this Jenkinsonian notion of the archivist's role as a passive recipient and neutral arbiter of records. However, with the rise of social history research, we began to see a progressive shift in the archival profession. In 1975, Wisconsin State Archivist F. Gerald Hamm declared that the most important task of archivists is to make an informed selection of information that will provide the future with a representative record of human experience in our time. And in the 1980s and the 1990s, the archival profession begins to critically reflect on itself through the introduction of postmodernism and critical theory to archival discourse, the development of new approaches to collection development, such as documentation strategy and post-custodialism, as well as the discussion and formation of community archives as a means to expand the historical record. These changes clearly reflect a departure from the professional philosophy of early archivists, such as Jenkinson, and recognize that the archivist does indeed have the responsibility to intervene in order to produce a more representative historical record. So while these debates within the professional discourse have been contentious, they have indeed led to tangible change within collection development policies and practices of archives. It is now a far more common and accepted practice for archives to seek out and collect materials from historically marginalized groups in order to build a more complete and representative historical record. While the diversification of collections has been a significant success within the archival profession, it does not fully address the challenge of this limited historical record that has been rightly critiqued by both humanists and archivists. Historically, the contents of an archive have been limited to physical materials, and furthermore, materials that can be physically acquired to reside within an archive. As we developed the Human Rights Documentation Initiative, we learned early on that these traditional archival assumptions around physical custody would not serve us in building a more robust historical record, and thus we began to explore alternative modes of archiving, such as a survivor-centered post-custodial archival framework that challenges traditional notions of custody and ownership that are really rooted in Western colonial practice. So before I describe this alternative mode of archiving, I want to provide a little bit more information about what the Human Rights Documentation, documentation Initiative actually is. I'll also refer to it as the HRDI. Uh, the HRDI is an initiative of the University of Texas Libraries that works to preserve fragile documentation of human rights violations worldwide by directly partnering with grassroots human rights organizations that don't have the resources, expertise, or infrastructure to preserve and provide access to this valuable documentation that they're collecting or creating. And the idea for the HRDI grew out of a 2007 Human Rights Archives and Documentation Conference that took place at Columbia University. And this conference brought together various human rights documentation stakeholders, such as human rights advocates, lawyers, academics, and archivists. And through the discussions of the conference, it became clear that digital preservation was one of the primary concerns of human rights advocates collecting and creating documentation of human rights violations, as well as the legal actors and researchers trying to actually access this documentation. And many grassroots human rights organizations turned to digital media, such as digital video, cameras, and cell phones, for its relative affordability and expediency in documenting violations. However, this digital documentation is particularly susceptible to loss due to its relative novelty and lack of established preservation practices. Small grassroots organizations rarely have the time, the expertise, um, or the resources to ensure the long-term preservation of their work. And these factors, compounded with political repression, greatly endanger the life of digital documentation of human rights violations. And so if this documentation is lost and cannot be used for legal accountability efforts, for education, for research, the negative impact to the historical record really is immeasurable. 
And so the UT Libraries, with its technological expertise as a leading research library and a mandate to collect and provide access to teaching and research resources, aim to address this preservation challenge by establishing these preservation partnerships with small grassroots human rights organizations um, that create this valuable documentation. And additionally, with one of the University of Texas' core values to serve as a catalyst for positive change in Texas and beyond, and the university's strong academic focus in human rights and the library's existing collection, collecting strengths in human rights, um, and endeavors such as the Human Rights Documentation Initiative strongly aligned with the university and the library's uh, strategic priorities. So as I mentioned, the primary aim of our work is to partner with these small grassroots human rights organizations to preserve and provide access to their materials. And to give you an idea of the scope of the materials in the collection, um, here's a list of our partners and where they're based. And to date, we've established nine of these preservation partnerships um, with diverse human rights organizations. Um, our first partnership was with the Kigali Genocide Memorial, which is a museum, a burial ground, and a documentation center that collects and creates photographs, <coughs> data, and audiovisual documentation of the genocide. And I'll be speaking much more in depth about that partnership later on. Um, one of our other prominent partnerships is with the Guatemala National Historical Police Archive, which is a massive 80 million page collection uh, that documents close to a century of the national police's operations, including during the Civil War period of the 1980s and 90s. We've also partnered with Free Burma Rangers, which is a small NGO based in Southeast Asia that provide um, humanitarian aid to internally displaced people in Burma, as well as document the human rights violations uh, committed by the Burmese army. Uh, we work with organizations in the U.S., such as Texas After Violence Project. Uh, they collect oral histories of people who have been impacted by the death penalty in Texas. Uh, we work with a New York-based organization called Witness, and they work with other small grassroots human rights organizations around the world, train them in um, video technology and how to create effective advocacy campaigns around a variety of human rights issues. And currently, we're completing a Mellon-funded project to partner with three archives in Central America to preserve documentation related to the civil wars in El Salvador and Guatemala, as well as the Afro-descendant population in Nicaragua. So when the libraries first conceived the Human Rights Documentation Initiative, it envisioned that our partner organizations would send the materials for digitization at UT, the libraries would retain digital copies of these materials, and then the material would be sent back to our partners. This model of collection development, which calls for physical custody of materials, is probably the one that's most familiar to people, and it is, in fact, um, the default model for archival repositories as well. However, when we first began establishing our partnership with the Kigali Genocide Memorial, it became clear that this traditional model of archival acquisition, which requires record creators to send the material to a distant repository for preservation, was really insufficient <coughs> for human rights documentation creators. We learned that human rights organizations were extremely hesitant, and rightfully so, to relinquish custody of their materials, even temporarily. For one, this documentation serves the immediate programming needs of the organization, be it education or advocacy, and removing the materials would severely disrupt their operations. Additionally, from a preservation standpoint, shipping the materials back and forth um, places an additional risk on the documentation's already fragile state. And considering the U.S.'s relations um, with the countries with whom we work and histories of intervention, as in the case of Central America, or not intervention in the case of Rwanda, um, it's really not difficult to understand why human rights organizations are reluctant to hand their materials over to a large U.S. institution. So the HRDI had to come up with an uh, alternative archival model that would facilitate both the use of these rich, unique information resources as well as address both the preservation and custody concerns of our partners. So drawing upon this post-custodial theory of archives, the HRDI began to develop an archival model that allows record creators to maintain custody over the materials while working with archivists to develop preservation and access solutions that fit their needs. And while the post-custodial theory was really developed to address the challenges of managing vast amounts of electronic information, um, and not specifically for human rights archiving, I think it provides a useful framework that can inform archival practices with community partners. Archivist Dr. Michelle Caswell builds upon this idea proposed by the post-custodial theory and further refines it for human rights archiving. Um, her development of a survivor-centered approach to human rights records foregrounds the principles of participation, shared stewardship, multiplicity, archival activism, and reflexivity. 
And the Survivor Center framework rightfully positions survivors of abuse at the center of archival theory and practice and shifts the role of the professional archivist uh, from selector and custodian of materials to a facilitator of memory work and from an all-knowing authority to an expert among experts. And it's precisely this framework that really orients the work that we do at the Human Rights Documentation Initiative. And through the course of establishing these nine partnerships, we learned that our partner organizations would not have chosen to work with us had it not been for this survivor-centered approach and the ability to maintain custody over their materials. And so to guide the next part of my talk, I will draw upon examples from the HRDI's work with the Kigali Genocide Memorial to illustrate how Caswell's five principles of the survivor Center post-custodial framework can be enacted and move us towards this decolonization of archival practice that diversifies the historical record as well as supports community struggles for empowerment. So I wanted to focus on our partnership with the Kigali Genocide Memorial because it's our longest running partnership and arguably one of the most visible and successful examples of a survivor center post-custodial partnership. The Kigali Genocide Memorial, or KGM as I'll also refer to it, is Rwanda's primarily, primary memorial site and it's located in the Gisozi neighborhood of the capital of Kigali. And in addition to serving as a museum, it's also a burial ground for 250,000 genocide victims or about a quarter of the million people that were killed during the genocide. <clears throat> the Museum and Documentation Center are staffed primarily by genocide survivors, including Eve, <coughs> who you see here, who's the director of the Documentation Center. And at the Documentation Center, this concept of multiplicity is really quite evident in the types of documentation and perspectives that it collects. Over the past 10 years, the Documentation Center has collected hundreds of video testimonies with elders, genocide survivors, rescuers, as well as filmed genocide of perpetrator testimonies at the local Gachacha court proceedings. And until recently, these videos were only available if you could actually visit the museum in, in Kigali, Rwanda. And so just to give you an idea of how fragile this documentation is and how dangerous it's also perceived to be, um, I want to share an incident that happened at Kigali Genocide Memorial. Um, back in 2008, shortly before uh, the University of Texas Libraries partnered with the Kigali Genocide Memorial, an unknown assailant threw a grenade into the museum grounds and tragically killed one of the security guards there. And this tragedy really highlighted the urgency of protecting both the memory workers but also the documentation that's held at the museum. And the staff knew that the material they that they're collecting would be invaluable for Rwanda's historical record as well as for international resource research, but they didn't really have the resources or the technical <coughs> infrastructure to make the materials available to a wider audience, either internationally or internationally. And so this need is really what served as the impetus for Kigali Genocide Memorial deciding to partner with the University of Texas. So Kigali Genocide Memorial was our first partnership and it was through our experience with them that we decided to adopt this survivor-centered post-custodial framework. They weren't comfortable with releasing their historical patrimony outside the country and sending their videos to UT for digitization. So as an alternative, we worked with them to design a workflow that would enable them to digitize the materials on site following archival standards. Once the videos are digitized, they're loaded up onto hard drives and then sent back to UT for long-term preservation and storage. So in this, in this model, KGM is able to maintain physical control over their materials while digital copies are sent to UT for the long-term preservation work. And the traditional archival model really disempowers record creating communities by taking the materials away from their oversight and expertise. But in the survivor center model, record creators are considered experts in their own records and are responsible for both the organization and the description of their material. As part of maintaining intellectual control over their materials, the staff at Kigali Genocide Memorial are responsible for the descriptive metadata associated with all the materials on the website. And in this survivor-centered framework, the archivist takes on more of a role as a consultant as opposed to the strict gatekeeper of materials. And so we work with our partners um, to utilize metadata standards that will enable them to capture all the information they need for their work, but also um, help support the technical and preservation work that we do at UT. And on a practical level, we found that it's really necessary for organizations to describe their own material, um, as it often requires language skill sets and expertise that aren't easily found in our institution or in Austin. And this is particularly true with the Kigali Genocide Memorial materials. Um, all their audiovisual testimonies are in Kenya, Rwanda. More importantly, however, this local description and organization practices 
really enables the KGM staff to acquire new skills by building archival and preservation capacity within the organization, as well as promoting their community's ownership of their cultural passion. So while we were able to work around uh, the issues of physical and intellectual custody, access still remained a primary challenge. Uh, due to the limited bandwidth in Rwanda, the Kigali Genocide Memorial was unable to provide access to the materials by hosting a website that had streaming video capabilities. And so UT worked with the Kigali Genocide Memorial to design a site that would be hosted at UT, but appear to be hosted in Rwanda. And the way we did that is um, the web address was genocidearchiverwanda.org.rw, which I'll share with you at the end of this presentation. Um, and the way in which we worked this out is the Kigali Genocide Memorial hosted a local copy of their website for on-site users at the museum. And then UT copied the material from this internal site and uploaded it to the public site that we hosted, um, which was openly accessible to an international audience. And the site, which was made to look like it was hosting Rwanda, really, again, helped Kigali Genocide Memorial maintain that intellectual ownership over its own uh, materials. So in this partnership the Kigali Genocide, with the Kigali Genocide Memorial, our role as archivists is not to dictate the partnership's outcomes, but to work with our partners to ensure that their documentation is preserved and accessible in a way that supports their organization's goals. And so, in the case of KGM, their documentation plays an essential role in the organization's work around uh, truth and reconciliation and education <coughs> for future generations. And so when we were able to help successfully launch the online digital archive for their materials, this helped KGM leverage additional financial resources from other national and international partners that supported their ongoing efforts in documentation and education work around genocide prevention. And we were really happy to see that our supporting role in that process could have a positive impact in helping them gain more support around the country and around the world for that work that they do. Um, <clears throat> on a day-to-day -day level, though, working with these human rights materials can be both tedious and exhausting, and it can also be difficult to find the time to reflect on the type of work that we're doing in human rights archives. But when working with human rights records, and particularly within the survivor-centered framework, um, internal and external modes of reflexivity are really necessary. For those working directly with human rights records, such as through digitization and indexing, it's important to take steps to mitigate the effects of exacerbating trauma or experiencing secondary trauma. In the case of Kigali Genocide Memorial, since it's primarily genocide survivors who work with the documentation, the organization actually employs a counselor who works with staff so they can process um, the impact of their work on their own mental health. And the organization also does activities like mental health days where the staff can um, bond together outside of the work environment and go somewhere and have fun. Um, we actually got to join them on one of those trips when we were visiting there. And this picture is from is from that field trip we went to Kibuye. Um, for <coughs> archivists who were involved with these survivor-centered partnerships, so critical reflexivity is essential. Um, this isn't a practice that archives have often admitted is even necessary, and thus are probably not very good at them. Um, so there will inevitably be missteps along the way. Um, at the HRDI, our goal is to really listen and to enable our partners to drive the collaboration instead of us paternalistically imposing our own vision and goals onto our partners and asking them to adapt. This foundation of trust and respect is really necessary for the sustainability of the Survivor Center post external collaborations. So what does success and sustainability look like in these Survivor Center collaborations? While that answer isn't always quantifiable, um, we found it is also important to have tangible successes 2.2, particularly if you're like us and are part of an academic institution and have to ju justify resource allocations. So in the case of our collaboration with the Kigali Genocide Memorial, we were able to successfully launch the Genocide Archive of Rwanda in 2010, which received coverage on BBC, Guardian, NPR, and a lot of other news outlet outlets. And since then, the technical infrastructure within Rwanda has improved, and Kigali Genocide Memorial is now able to host its digital archive for the world without relying on UT uh, servers. And so that's a big accomplishment on their end. 
on our end, we've been able to provide access to materials that would not otherwise be available for scholarship, teaching, or research. And the library has also been able to position itself as an integral part of the university's scholarly endeavor around human rights and social justice. And since the archive launched in 2010, we've seen an average of about three academic articles a year that either reference or cite the archive, which is definitely the highest level of citation that we have for any of our collections in the human rights documentation initiative. So that's really awesome to see as well. More broadly, however, these types of survivor center partnerships repositions the libraries to play a valuable role in helping to preserve parts of the historical record that would otherwise be lost or completely obliterated. And most importantly, however, the survivor center post-custodial partnerships empowers communities to serve as custodians to their own history and to tell their stories not as victims, which is often how they're portrayed in the media, but as resilient change agents. So as I conclude, I want to share with you some of the materials from the archives because I think it articulates the power and the potential of these survivor center partnerships much better than me just talking about it. So let's segue to the archive. Um, the first video that I want to show you is from one of the collections from Witness. It's called um, If Hope Were Enough, and it was it's a documentary that was created by the um, Women's Caucus for Gender Justice, and they were women that went to the International Criminal Court and were lobbying for the ICC to recognize gender-based violence as a crime, as a human rights violation. And so this video that we're going to watch is an interview that they did with Francois Negan Dehayo, who was the um, advisor to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda on gender issues, and she also provided victim support. And in this uh, such segment of the interview, she talks about some of the barriers um, that women face in participating in ICTR and the accountability process and in providing their testimonies for this uh, official record of what happened in Rwanda. <coughs> so let's get into that.
social justice space where you draw the boundaries between intervention and, and help. You know, because for instance, you provide, or as far as I understand, you provide um, uh, psychological, you know, therapy and, and, and no. we don't do that. No, okay. Our partner organizations okay. are responsible okay. for, for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering, you know, isn't it hard sometimes then to basically listen to these testimonies and think, oh, we could so easily help this one person who's living in poverty, for instance, you know, and just take, I don't know, a certain low amount of dollars. Or you know, but basically the question, where do you, since your project is specifically social justice based, unlike many other traditional archives that don't have this proclaimed mission, where do you draw the boundary there? Um, for us, I think we, we do what our partners ask us to do. So our partners haven't asked us for monetary support that doesn't have to do with the project that I work on. Since so many of these um, places are in, that are telling the stories are in dangerous situations, how do you ensure continued access to these um, things that are held in the guarantee that, but um, one example with the Guatemala National Police Archive, um, it's a physical archive that's located in Guatemala City, as I mentioned, they have 80 million paper documents. Um, we actually serve more as the digital archive for them, but they were concerned back in 20, I think it was 2010 or 2012, they were about to have a presidential election, and they knew that the person who was going to win, the current pres president, or who just resigned out of prison, you know, was going to win the election, they were concerned not going to be supportive of the archive. And so part of the strategy when we launched the digital archive was to launch it around the time of the presidential elections. And so if and when he did win, if, if he, there wouldn't be as much um, reason for him to shut down a physical archive if there was already a digital archive available. And so uh, the archive staff felt like that afforded them a certain buffer or protection for the physical materials. Um, in the case of Rwanda, they, Kigali is actually one of the safest cities in Africa right now. They haven't had any more physical threats. Um, and the current administration in the country is also very supportive of their efforts. Um, I think it's safe to say that this memorial center is actually doing the most comprehensive archival work in the country. And so I think that affords that, that their relationship with the administration also affords them Thanks for your papers. Um, I learned a lot. Um, um, the examples that, especially the Rwanda example, I mean, where there's been this kind of really concerted effort to have a kind of uh, a kind of truth and reconciliation process that they've been going through for a long time, um, and that there's a kind of a sense that you know we're going to put it behind us. Um, I, well, I'm not sure. I mean, that's I'm just kind of spec I'm I'm, I'm trans, trans, transposing what, what the, their their language would be different, but. Um, but what about situations where people are still angry, or people, and there is, a, there's, a, there's a concern, especially since there is a kind of cooperative and non-directive approach that you guys are taking, um, that in one of the some of the principles that you outlined. Um, if the other party, if the if the partner wants to present a, a version of the history that you might feel be concerned is, let's say, biased, mm -hmm. right, or partisan, or vindictive um, to the powers that you know, that that. Um, to, to, the, to the people that have used a certain community. Um, how, do, how might you guys decide to handle that? And would you just sort of say, okay, well, forget it, we're not gonna do it? Or um, is there a way to solve, to resolve that? I mean, I just think about, you know, what's happening in the US. I think about, you know, if we were gonna do a version of this, let's say, post-Ferguson, right? Ta I mean, I'm not, maybe that's not on your agenda, but but it, it um, I mean, that's something that's what people are talking about. How do we archive, like, the anger of African-American folks on Twitter, right? Um, and, and, and and on the streets, right? And and and, um, <coughs> and some of that anger is not necessarily. It's it's the heat of the moment. There's a lot of power and passion in it. It's not always. We're not always archiving things that are objectively true and historically. You know, kind of. You see what I'm kind of getting at there. So how do we how do we navigate that with the archival approach? I mean, I would argue that no archive is objective or neutral, regardless of the appearance of it. Um, in our case, where we are clearly uh, working with politi explicitly political material. Our philosophy is really to have our partners determine what this collaboration looks like. And so, I mean, I think there's some people who would say that the Kigali Genocide Memorial Archive is really biased. Um, if you look at some of the texts, um, I believe they they call the genocide the genocide of the Tutsi. 
Um, and there's been there's a lot of critiques of, of the president of Rwanda and sort of his um, using of the genocide to kind of silence dissent. Um, so I, we there was actually a law professor um, who is very critical of the current administration in Rwanda and also sees this project as being biased and weighted towards that administration. But for us, we the community is still very this community memorial is still very much respected with Rwanda and there is a lot of value to the work that they're doing. And so uh, we want to we want to be able to support that. And if other people came to us with records from maybe a different perspective, I think we would also 